Hey everybody, Tim Albrecht here, and welcome to this week's episode of the Ask a YFP CFP segment of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast, where we feature questions from you, the YFP community, to be answered by one of YFP Planning's fee-only certified financial planners. Before we jump into today's question, I want to give a shout out to YFP Planning's incredible team that makes this segment possible. YFP Planning offers fee-only comprehensive financial planning that is customized to the pharmacy professional. You can learn more and book a free discovery call at yfpplanning.com. Again, that's yfpplanning.com. Okay, this week's question comes from Tabata who asks, I plan to retire early. I work for the state and have a 5% mandatory retirement contribution for a pension plan. I also have a 3% 401k type plan, not a 401k, but not exactly sure what it is. You can't pull from either until your 60s. What do I need to invest in so I can retire earlier and have an income coming in other than through real estate. She also mentions, I think, I think it's called bridging. Tim Baker, what are your, what are your thoughts here? Yeah. So I actually had never heard the term bridging, Tim, to be completely honest through all my I haven't either. studies yeah. through uh, CFP and the RICP, which is uh, retirement income focused. I like it though. I mean, it, it kind of applies. I, I did put in into the Googles bridging and retirement, and there was a a financial firm that was talking about this as if it was an established term, but they defined it as the bridge period is the gap between the age you retire and the age you can draw from your retirement accounts. This is what Tabitha is, is talking about the 59 and a half, 60 years old, 59 and a half is uh, basically kind of like that paywall that you put your money behind that is really meant to make it so that these accounts truly are for retirement. So the idea mm-hmm. is that you should put money into 401k, an IRA, a Roth IRA, a 403b, that outside of some exceptions, and we'll talk about those here in a second, you can't really pull those monies out until you basically attain the age 59 and a half to avoid that 10% penalty. So if I'm age 50 and I'm like, I'm going through a you know midlife crisis and I want to buy that sports car and I pull $100,000 out of my 401k, I'm going to be basically paying the tax on that distribution, Tim, but I'm also going to pay a a 10% penalty on that money because it's not for retirement. But to go back to the bridging thing, I mean, you can have a bridge to get to that 59 and a half years uh, old. I think you can also have a bridge to get to like your social security age or even a delayed social security age. So you're, you know, receiving those, those credits if you do delay all the way out to age 70. So I think there's a few bridging um, strategies that you can use here. So to get back to the, you know, the exception. So most of the exceptions are kind of laid out in the IRS code and in section 72 T. So it's, it's really to avoid the, the, the 10% penalty. It's for things like death, mm-hmm. disability, home purchase. You can make, you know, you can use some, do- some dollars for first time home purchase, medical expenses. And then, you know, we'll, we'll talk about 72 T in terms of like the substantially equal periodic payments. So this rule basically allows you to withdraw from your your IRA, withdraw from your 401k. If you basically promise to take at least five substantially equal payments and the payments depend on, you know, your owner's life, the owner's life expectancy, you know, that's calculated through IRS approved methods. Uh, You can also withdraw these funds according to a specific schedule that you basically outline with the IRS. And you must adhere to this payment schedule for at least five years until you reach age 59 and a half, whichever is later. So there are ways to access that money. And essentially what the what the government wants to, you, to, you to do is pay the tax mm-hmm. in, a, in a way that is kind of equal with what everyone else is doing. But there are exceptions to that. The other rule, Tim, that's out there is the rule of 55, which basically is for just for employer and spo- sponsored retirement plans. So 401ks, 403bs, mm-hmm. TSPs, et cetera. And this rule allows employees who leave their job for re- really any reason to start taking penalty free distributions from their most recent job on once yeah. they e- reach age 55. So it's kind of like a, a little bit of a hardship. It allows you to kind of, you know, do that without penalty. So those are really the main things. You have the rule 72 T, which is which is kind of really looking at substantially equal payments, at least over a five year schedule. You have the rule of 55. But, you know, I think one of the other things about this about this question is like, okay, If I don't want to do those things, like I say, I don't want to, you know, basically draw on these retirement accounts early and kind of circumvent that 59 and a half years old, like, what do I do? So this is one of the appropriate uses of like a tax 
taxable or a brokerage account. Mm -hmm. So I often say, so uh, in a lot of cases when we're working with, you know, pharmacists, they're funding this account really out of like curiosity or ease of use from like a Robin Hood or something like that. It's just a, yeah. a way to wet their whistle in the retire or in the in the investment world. But it's often out of order, right? So we're we're still not maxing out some of these other buckets before we get to that. But this is a place that after you're maxing out some of these 401ks, the IRAs, or if you have early retirement aspirations, this is one that I would be hidden early and often. Mm -hmm. So there aren't any rules about taking the money out. You can really take it out whenever you want. There's no income limits or contribution limits or anything like that. This is just a, you know, an account that you set up. You put cash in it and then you invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, et cetera. The big thing here that you that happens in a taxable account is that you pay tax on the capital gains, which is what you don't yeah. do inside of a 401k or an IRA. So what does that mean? That means that if I buy a share of ABC mutual fund at $100 per share in 2022, and then I go and retire in 10 years in 2032, and that $100 per share gro grows to $250 per share, inside of an IRA, I don't pay capital gains on that $150 mm -hmm. per share gain. Yep. Inside of a taxable account, I do. So it's an extra tax that you know I just have to calculate for. But these accounts are often really helpful to get you to that 59 and a half year bridge. So you'll say, okay, let's say I'm going to retire at 58. Basically, I need two years of expenses before I can draw on that account. And then when I'm at 60, that, that opens up basically my 401k, my TSP, my 403b, my IRA. Some people even wait longer and draw more out of those accounts. So then when they get to age 68, 69, 70, that's when they're delaying social security is what, what I talked about before. Yeah. So the taxable account is probably going to be the biggest thing that I would, I would, be, I would be looking at here. The other one... Obviously, that Shane mentioned was real estate. So <clears throat> real estate is great and provides a lot of flexibility because of the income it provides as you own that property, but then also through, you know, throughout retirement. Yep. But another thing that you could potentially do is earmark a property or the property or one of your properties as something to liquidate and sell, and then basically use the proceeds of that sale for the purpose of, of your bridge. So that's another option. You could invest in a, in a business. Obviously, that's something that could provide income that doesn't necessarily isn't tied to the 59 and a half year, year rule. And then the other thing that you could potentially do is you could say, okay, I'm going to retire at age 55. I have five years. You could purchase an annuity, an immediate annuity that could be term certain or could pay you out until you die. But basically, you're converting some of your 401k dollars, your IRA dollars, which is allowable if it's an immediate term annuity and not subject to the 59 and a half year rule that you say, okay, I'm going to peel off $200,000 or $100,000, whatever it is, and I'm going to buy this annuity. And that annuity is going to give me an income stream until I reach age 60 mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, whatever, however you set it up. So that's another investment that kind of solves that, you know, problem, so to speak. I think if you have a lot of time to prepare for this, the, the taxable, the brokerage account is probably going to be the best thing to get money into to really allows you to weather that early retirement storm, so to speak. At the end of the day, no matter if you're retiring early or not, you're going to want monies in a taxable account, in a pre-tax account, and in, in an after-tax account like a Roth. Yeah. And basically, you're pulling from all three of those sources, depending on where they're at, to basically build your retirement paycheck. So obviously, very multifaceted. It's a great question, not something that you know we've been asked before. I love the the term bridging. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I haven't really heard We're of that. use but, it. But uh, yeah, yeah. We'll definitely use that in the future, Tim. I love this question too, Tim, and I, I love your approach because it really highlights the value of backwards planning, right? You, you always say, hey, let's let's start with the vision. I think the planning team does such an awesome job of this. Let, let's start with the vision, the plan. Obviously, that may change over time, and then let's backwards plan into how we're going to get there. But but we often go the other way around, right? You know, It's just natural. We opt into an employer plan or we hear about someone else who's doing you know Roth contributions or brokerage or real estate or whatever. And we start kind of putting money in all these different buckets or over time we do that, but we haven't necessarily re really looked at like, what, what's the vision? What's the goal? Where are we trying to go? And, you know, to your point, like when it comes to early retirement, how long is that time period? Right. Yeah. Because, you know, we're looking at not only the bridge to when we can draw without penalty, you mentioned obviously the connection with social security, re really important consideration of when you're going to draw that. 
you know, one thing we didn't talk about here would even be health healthcare expenses until you reach an age of Medicare. How, how long is that? So if it's 45 or 50 versus like 60, that's a very different, you know, conversation. And then obviously, you know, where, where are the funds, uh, where, where are they coming from and, and what's the goals that we have in retirement as well? So, yeah. And, and another thing to even bring up in, in, and not necessarily what you, what a lot of people think in this, it's like, so the question is, what do I need to invest in so I can retire early? It's going to kind of sound counterintuitive, but like, you know, like the human capital, like investing in your career, like to me, the big thing I would be saying, if, if this person were a client, like, are there ways for you to, you know, earn income either by doing consulting or things like that, you know, remotely to give you flexibility? That is a form of investment that you can do that allows you to, to bridge that. So you, you yes. might not be pu- punching a clock and going to a, you know, an office or working for the state. But it still allows you to, you know, bring in income to kind of, you know, bridge some of that, some of that income as well. So yeah. it's another investment that I think is is kind of overlooked is, you know, setting yourself up for that, you know, transition is, okay, you might not be, you know, retired, retired, but you're, you're not p- punching the clock, you can still travel or do the things that you want to do. And I think, again, I, I think people who retire early, it's, it's, it's not necessarily about um, not working. It's sometimes it's just about of like, you know, just doing it on your terms and, and what yeah. that looks like. So I would also be talking about that, you know, from, from the client perspective as well. Great question. A couple of the resources I would mention, uh, we'll link to these in the show notes. We have a book that we have, uh, published authored by Jeff Keimer, fire RX, the pharmacist's guide to financial independence talks a lot about what, what Tim, you know, talked about here on this episode, considerations for those that are thinking, that early retirement uh, strategy. So we would encourage you to pick up a copy of that. And we also have a, a blog post also authored by uh, Jeff Keimer on the fire prescription, how to retire early as a pharmacist. So good, good resources to supplement this episode if you're interested in that topic more. And again, we'll link to those two in the show notes. So great question. Uh, Tabitha, as a small thank you, we're going to be sending you a super comfy YFP t-shirt. And for those that are listening, we'd like to hear from you with your questions, two ways that you can submit your question. One, you can send us an email info at yourfinancialpharmacist.com, or you can also record your question by visiting yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash askyfp. As we wrap up this week's episode of the Ask a YFP CFP segment, an important reminder that the content in this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. For more information on this, you can visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thanks for listening and have a great rest of your week.